Our first speaker is Natalie Zemondevis. She was born in Detroit. And at the famous nearby Kingswood School, Cranbrook, she developed an, an abiding love for history. Further education at Smith, Radcliffe, com and Radcliffe culminated in a doctorate at the University of Michigan. She's taught at Brown, the University of Toronto, Berkeley, Princeton, where she was the Henry Charles Lee Professor of History. She now lives in Toronto, where at the university she's adjunct professor of history, anthropology, and medieval studies. Dr. Davis is clearly recognized as one of the greatest living historians. As a historian, she has chosen to focus less on the famous events and heroes of history and more on the everyday lives of peasants, artisans, and women of the early modern world. In her seven books and many essays, she has mined the resources of anthropology, literary scholarship, and of note, also feature films. She notes that the films sometimes provide a valuable way of telling about the past. She nourishes work set in the sixth century with 20th and 21st century questions, which give it present day resonance. One book came from her work as a consultant and scriptwriter for the 1982 French film Le Retour de Martin Guerre, a slightly fictionalized account of a sixth century peasant impersonating a husband returning from war, a story which has inspired novels and opera and the 1993 film Summersby starring Richard Guerre. Dr. Davis's 1983 version, The Return of Martin Guerre, became her best known work. It's been translated into 20 different languages. Her work is thoroughly grounded in the rigorous archival research. For her, the archive itself is a special place. She has written that while studying in an archive, the room itself becomes closely identified with the traces of the past she is examining and the smell of the old wood, the shape of the windows and the sounds from the cobblestone street can elicit a spell. Readers, readers often fall under the same spell. We look forward to this morning to her essay on Leo Africanus discovers comedy, 16th century theater across the Mediterranean divide. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. This afternoon I want to describe through the persons of the North African Muslim Hassan al-Razan and the Italian Jew Jacob Montino an encounter between two traditions of theater and poetry in the early 16th century. The story caught my attention a few years ago when the Stratford Festival commissioned the playwright Wajdi Muawad to write a play linked to my recently published Trickster Travels. The hero of that book was a man Europeans called Leo Africanus, a Moroccan diplomat who spent several years of his life in Italy in the 1520s as a seeming Christian. Before returning to North Africa and Islam in 1527, he left behind him manuscripts in Italian and Latin describing Africa and the world of Islam, one of which, the description of Africa, became a European bestseller. Once I began to imagine how Hassan al-Razan would be represented on stage, I asked myself for the first time about the Arabic theatrical tradition. An initial look at the literature was discouraging. Arabic theater supposedly began only in 1847 when Moliere's Lavar was performed in translation in Beirut. Well, I knew from my years of work on popular cultures that could not be right. And sure enough, in the last 20 years, studies pioneered by an Egyptian-born Muslim teaching in Oxford and a Baghdad-born Jew teaching in Jerusalem have shown centuries of vigorous popular theater, primarily comic and satirical, across the entire Arab and Islamic world. Well, before turning to Arabic theater, let me just introduce Hassan ibn Muhammad al-Wazan. Born in Granada around 1488, in the last years of the Muslim kingdom there, he grew up in Fez and studied at its great madrasas. 
Along with law, philosophy, and religion, he learned to write poetry, essential for any young man seeking proper culture in good letters and expression. Poetry was also a skill required for the diplomatic career on which was on embarked in 1508, charged with missions by the Sultan of Fez, which were to take him uh, down to the sub-Saharan land of the blacks, across North Africa to Egypt, and to the Ottoman court at Istanbul. Every diplomatic visit required appropriate dress, performance, and poetry. After presenting gifts, Wazan recited, recited a panegyric poem, the Qasida al-Mad, which he had composed in honor of the ruler. The genre had centuries of rules behind its rhyme scheme and its ordering. In the first part, the poet always spoke of himself and, and or of his people. The second part turned to praise of the ruler being addressed with oblique reference to what outcome he hoped from the visit. And you listeners will be surprised to soon hear much more about the panegyric. Besides his diplomatic duties, Awazan had time on his travels to learn much else about Africa and always had his ears open for poetry. In the deserts south of Clemson and Tunis, he listened to the long poems and epics of love, hunting, and war, sung by Arab nomads, often in dialogue, and found them most elegant and sweet. He also read poets in manuscript and memorized their poems, enabling him to recite them by memory years later in Italy. A favorite poetic genre, which, like the panegyric, turns out to be relevant to our theatrical pursuit, was called hijja, that is, invective, mockery. Hijja could be directed against a person or group. Its language could be light or coarse. It should have a moral goal of some kind, not just be vindictive, but it must be found amusing. Wazan, Wazan found the language of vituperation in one such poem marvelous and elegant. Now, clearly performative elements abounded in the culture Wazan knew. But we haven't heard much yet about what we would literally call theater or actors. So let me now present that theater that existed for centuries across the Muslim world from Persia to Muslim Spain. It was fed by two streams. One was an old tradition of storytelling in markets and public squares. The teller would often act out the story, taking on the voices of the different characters and punctuating the events with tambourine or flute. Folk tales and events were recounted, while one group of storytellers, known as kusas, specialized in popular religious stories, including from the Quran. This was the closest that practitioners of Sunni Islam came to anything resembling religious theater. The other stream leading to Arabic theater was even more important, with links to shamanic rituals, fertility rites, and the changes of season. An early and enduring dramatic practice involved men on wooden horses decorated with skirts. As Maimonides described them in 12th century Cairo, they danced and jousted, performing live plays. And he used the Arabic word for live plays. Uh, actors, some masked as animals or jinns, Buffoons and mimes were parts of festivities and processions of all kinds, at the New Year's in many places, at the yearly flooding of the Nile, at family celebrations. Players performed individually, but also in troops with changes of costumes which they slung over ropes tied up for the occasion. Well, who were these actors? A majority were men, Muslims and the occasional Jew, who could also dance, sing, juggle, and generate clever quips and stories. Women also served in such performances, ordinarily acting with other women. Maimonides had seen them in Cairo, going from house to house, masked, and also on hobby horses. Some of them may have been slaves, but whatever the case, these women always risked being called fasikat, that is, lewd and licentious, and being coupled with prostitutes. The plays, or kayal in Arabic, were performed in the streets, in marketplaces, and especially when time to a wedding or circumcision in the courtyard of people's houses. Though occasionally a ruler invited players to perform on his premises, the kayal was a profoundly popular or low art, the language usually in verse, 
but always colloquial. The expression and gestures were impudent, mocking, funny, sexy, and satirical. This burlesque and satirical tone was also the mark of the Kayal Alzeel, that is, shadow plays performed by torchlight with leather, leather puppets and put on in Islamic lands already in the 10th century. We have some inkling of the themes of these plays cre created by the actors themselves. We hear of the play of the villager, where some farmer was the butt, the play of Um Kwawishti and her husband's second wife, making fun of women's quarrels, and especially the play of the judge, which mocked the corruption of judges, a much repeated motif. This popular theater sometimes nourished the imagination of learned and literary writers. The beloved Arabic genre of the makama, which features a wandering trickster poet in disguise, has roots in popular theatrical performance. When a major 13th century Kyrene poet, Ibn Daniyal, briefly turned his hands to theater, he did not, however, move in the direction of serious dramatic literature, or what we might call tragic. Rather, he wrote shadow plays for the Sultan's puppeteer, full of sexual mischief and trickery. His low-life characters and their mixture of literary and colloquial Arabic satirized the panegyric poetry which he himself had written. Well, such were the varieties of popular and comic theater being performed in the lands known to Wazan. In his description of Africa, written for Italian readers in 1526, he made some reference to these at Fez. He mentioned the Mukanas, the men who cross-dressed and acted like women. He mentioned women diviners, whom he called sukakiyat, the Arab word for lesbian. He unmasked them, as these diviners, as actors, actresses, taking on the voice of jinns to win gifts and sexual pleasure. In his fullest account, he described groups of men in Fez who resembled the churmatori. He used an Italian word referring both to actors and to street hawkers. They go through the streets singing the stories of battles and other matters with their instruments such as drums, harps, and viols. When they hear there's a wedding in town, they go without being called to serenade the spouses. When they're singing in the squares, they also sell written charms to be used against some evil or other. Wazan's brief reference to Arabic theater, which you've just heard, these brief references were ambivalent, a feeling shared by other learned men, all of them lovers of poetry, the highest art. Though they might enjoy and laugh at these plays, these outdoor performances, with their often improvised and colloquial style and their irregular verse, were not to be taken seriously by those who savored intricate meters and rhymed prose. When he wanted to insult his fellow poets, a 14th century writer said their foolish and jumbled verses sounded like scenes from live plays. Thus, Arabic theater existed for centuries, funny, saucy, critical, and sometimes associated with transgressive sexuality without being incorporated into Arabic cultural and literary theory and without receiving major patronage from rulers' courts. Nothing illustrates this distance so well as the Arab commentary on Aristotle's poetics, especially by that great 12th century philosopher Ibn Rushd, whom we call Averroes. Aristotle had described the poetic tragedies and comedies of Athens so that non-Athenians could compose, perform, and respond to them appropriately. Averroes' goal, centuries later, was to use the poetics as a guide not for theater, but for poetry and the speech of the Arabs. The words tragedy and comedy, he translated and discussed in terms of the beloved Arabic genres of panegyric, almad, and satire, or invective, hijjah. He drew examples from Arabic poetry, including verses from the Quran, to illustrate Arab, Aristotle's theater, theories of narrative and metaphor. Well, Wazan may not have read Aristotle's poetics, the medieval Arabic translation existed in very few copies, but he knew very well the writings of the man he called Ibn Rushd. He would one day have much to tell Europeans. In 1518, returning from Istanbul to Fez, Wazan's boat was captured on the Mediterranean by a Christian pirate. 
He was delivered to Pope Leo X, who was delighted to have a Muslim diplomat as captive just when he was trying to rouse Europe's rulers for a new crusade against the Turk. After 15 months of imprisonment, Wazan was baptized at St. Peter's and given the Pope's own name, Giovanni Leone. For the next seven years, he lived a double life, performing and dressed as a Christian while following the Muslim law of taqiyya, dissimulation, which allowed conversion so long as one stayed true to Islam in one's heart. It wasn't easy, for Christendom and Islam were at war, and preachers on both sides were calling for jihad, including Giovanni Leone's own godfather, Cardinal Egidio de Viterbo. Giovanni Leone learned to write in Italian and Latin, assumed the narrative voice of a man between worlds, and told Europeans about Africa and the Middle East, its religion, its learned poetry, its learned men, and its poetry. His own situation must have made him especially interested in the diverse forms of Italian theater, which he could view in Rome, Venice, and elsewhere in Italy once he was able to travel. The late medieval popular theater in the streets, squares, markets, with its buffoons, jugglers, mimes, its mass performers standing on benches or on a makeshift stage, and its snatches of comedy would have seemed utterly familiar to him. As you heard, he recognized the similarity with North Africa sufficiently to use the Italian word cirmatori to describe to European readers the popular theater in the public spaces of Fez. A second theatrical form was new to Giovanni Leone, the mystery and miracle plays. Not long after his baptism, his godfather, Cardinal Egidio, would have made sure that Giovanni Leone attended the passion play put on every Easter by an important charitable confraternity. Performing in the Colosseum with elaborate scenery, young men from wealthy families acted out the events of Holy Week, culminating in the crucifixion of Jesus and the death of Judas. At its end, the actor playing the crucified Christ was born in a penitential procession which passed through the Jewish quarter and across Rome to their home church. Unlike the popular street theater, the passion play of the Colosseum would be strange and shocking to Wazan Giovanni Leone. As always for a Muslim, any suggestion of a divine Christ was an insult to God's supreme sovereignty. Jesus, son of Mary, however exalted, was a human prophet. Theatrical representation made the sacrilege worse, going well beyond the religious storytelling in a Fez marketplace. If Giovanni Leone would have preferred to close his ears and eyes to religious plays, there was one form of Italian theater that aroused his interest, the new comedy. Like Arab scholars, European scholars had long kept their distance from theatrical performance as a high art or as a path to truth, however much, they must, however much they might watch plays. Arab scholars had turned reflection on ancient theater, as you heard, into a guide for poetry. Medieval European scholars, when they went beyond St. Augustine's condemnation to find some merit in an ancient theatrical performance, still saw it as part of a long dead past. The humanist passion for the classical theater in Italy changed this picture. In the last half of the 15th century, they began writing Latin comedies based on those of Rome. And in 1498, Venetian printers published the newly found comedies of Aristophanes and a fresh Latin translation of Aristotle's poetics. Vitruvius's rediscovered, rediscovered book on architecture was offering new ideas for scenery with perspectives. In 1508, at carnival time, Ariosto produced his first comedy in Italian with patronage from the ducal court of Ferrara. The flood of the new comedy had opened. Well, the important example for our Giovanni Leone is Machiavelli's Mandragola, the Mandrake Route. Leo X had it performed at the Vatican Palace in, in September 1520 and invited his cardinals and all the important people in Rome to attend. Giovanni Leone was surely there in the entourage of the godfather Egidio. Well, let me remind you of the plot. Young Calamaco has fallen madly in love with his beautiful and chaste Lucretia, who is the wife of the old lawyer Nietzsche, who is dismayed that Lucretia has not become pregnant. In connivance with Lucretia's confessor, Calamaco masquerades as physician and tells Nietzsche, 
There's not a cure more certain to make a woman become pregnant than to give her a potion to drink made from the mandrake root. The only inconvenience is that the first man who has sex with Lucrezia after taking the potion will soon die. Nisha adopts this plan when Kalamako pr promises to kidnap a young lout on the streets and put him in bed with Lucretia. Lucretia, persuaded by her confessor, takes the potion. The young lout, of course, is Kalamako, whom, whom Lucretia much prefers to Nietzsche as a lovemaker. Nietzsche, grateful that, that Dr. Kalamako's stratagem will give him an heir, gives the phony physician the key to his house. The play ends with everyone in church. <laughs> Sitting in the Vatican audience, Giovanni Dioni would have been at home with Leo X's two buffoons who clowned before the play began, but then astonished at what he learned was called a commedia. The plot was amusing, but he would have been surprised at the elaborate staging and scenery. Ruses and sexual stratagems were very much part of Arabic storytelling and popular street theater, but learned creation of indoor live theater on such sub subjects in front of the theologians and judges of Fez or Cairo would be unlikely. Cardinal Egidio, who had, preached against, who had preached sermons against prostitution, must have squirmed in his seat during the performance, but many in the assembly were absolutely delighted. In the next year, the play was also performed at several other towns on Giovanni Leone's path, and in 1524, he could read the play itself, published in Rome with the title Commedia Intitolata Mandragola. By that same year, Giovanni Leone also had the chance to talk about theater with the scholar physician Jacob Montino of Bologna. Montino was from a Catalan Jewish family which had fled Spain about the same time as the Wazan family had left Granada for Fez. In addition to his medical practice, Montino was, was kept busy making Latin translations of the commentaries of Averroes on the divine Aristotle, basing them on medieval Hebrew translations um, from the Arabic. Hearing of the learned Muslim convert from North Africa, Montino invited him to work with him on an Arabic, Hebrew, Latin dictionary. Montino had several links to theater and knew Ariosto's comedy. He could also tell Giovanni Leone how Jewish troops in Mantua were putting on plays for Christians at carnival time, including one on Esther. Mantino could share concern with Giovanni Leone about the Easter passion plays. They often threatened to erupt, in fact did erupt, in attacks on the Jews. Especially important, Mantino had on his agenda a new Latin translation of Averroes' commentary on Aristotle's poetics based on a 14th century Hebrew translation from the Arabic. Now that Hebrew translation followed Averroes in using the Hebrew terms for panegyric and invective or ridicule rather than making a Hebrew translation of the Greek tragedy and comedy. And today, if you look up, he, that is the, he, the Hebrew word for tragedy and comedy is a Hebrew transliteration. Of, he used the words for panegyric and invective. But the Hebrew translation omitted virtually all of Averroes' many quotations from Arabic poetry. For Mantino, who now had the new Latin translation of Aristotle's poetics, Averroes' commentary hovered confusedly between theater and non-dramatic poetry. He surely hoped that his guest from North Africa, himself a poet, could straighten things out. Giovanni Leone responded, by describing to Mantino both Arabic live theater and the forms of, and meters of Arabic poetry. In the Arabic column of their dictionary, the Jewish, the Hebrew Arabic uh, uh, Latin dictionary, in the Arabic column, Giovanni Leone included important theatrical terms like kayal, the word for live theater. We can assume that these were occasions for his telling Mantino about dramatic performance and about shadow theater, while of course not elevating them to the level of real poetry. As for Averroes' most excellent commentaries on the poetics, Giovanni Leone would have affirmed to Mantino 
that it was indeed about poetry, that Averroes' commentary on poetics was about poetry, about panegyric and satire, Ahmad and Hija. The Hebrew translation was right when it used those words rather than tragedy and comedy. With his remarkable memory for poetry, he would have recited to Mantino some of those verses missing from the Hebrew and Latin translations of Averroes. Then, called back to Rome in early 1524, he left the dictionary manuscript with Mantino and went on to write for him a book in Latin on Arabic poetic meters. Well, what was the outcome of the relation between these two men, the erudite Jew and the talented Muslim, temporarily a Christian? I am sorry not to be able to report that their exchanges had a major effect on their thinking about theater and poetry. When I started the project, I'd hope it would. It did not. <laughs> it did not. Mantino prepared his Latin translation of Averroes' commentary on Aristotle's poetics for the multi-volume Venetian edition of all Aristotle's works. The words panegyric and satire, he mostly replaced by tragedia and comedia, by tragedy and comedy. Where Averroes had turned Aristotle's word spectacle into poetic speculation, Mantino used the word for theatrical spectacle and put in the margin, I believe Averroes did not understand this. As for the many quotations from Arabic poetry that had been omitted from the original manuscript and that I'm suggesting he, he knew about from, all, from, all was on, from was on, Mantino did not comment on their absence. After all, what European readers wanted to glean from this text was not information about Averroes and Arabic poetry, but insight into the teachings of Aristotle, especially they as they related to the new Italian interest in recreating ancient theater. As for Giano, Giovanni Leone, he took the various ideas about comedy and put them to work only within the Arabic classification of literary genres. He used the word commedia, comedy once, in the course of describing the controversies around the rationalist Averroes that la lost, lasted long after the philosopher's death. He said he'd seen a poem about Averroes in the, quote, comedies of a 14th century Tunisian author. The comedy, he claimed, was constructed as a debate between two litigants, one vituperating Averroes for heresy, the other praising him for his nobility, justice, and teaching. Now, there is no such Arabic poem with the word comedies or its title. The text Giovanni Leone is describing was either a book of hijja, uh, that is satirical verse, or more likely a makama. Giovanni Leone was taking a term currently fashionable in Italy for theater and reclaiming it as the name for an Arabic poetic genre. We have comedies too, he tells Italians, and have had them for centuries in the high form of poetry. Finally, in Giovanni Leone's uh, Africa book, we do get a sly echo of the mandragola, the mandrake root, which he knew Italians would savor. He gives a botanical report that makes up the last paragraph of his 900-page manuscript. The Cernog root. <laughs> this root grows in the Atlas Mountains on its western slope. The people there say that the Cernog root has a great veer too. And of course, all the people who know Machiavelli will hear this is one of Machiavelli's favorite words. A great veer too. And gives an erection to a man's organ and multiplies the times he can have intercourse if he takes it in a potion. And they say that any maiden who happens to piss on this root suddenly loses her virtue, his or her virginity, through its virtu. But this author, that is Giovanni Leone, believes that such a story was made up by some ribald rogue who had penetrated a virgin, a, pardon, who had penetrated a virgin and used the story as an excuse so as not to shame her before her parents when she got pregnant. The tale of Mantino and Wazan may open our eyes to how deeply embedded in cultural identity styles of representation can be, especially when they are supported by social hierarchies of learning and supported by political structures.
So we can imagine always on telling his fellow learned men back in North Africa about that Kayal he'd seen among the high priests of the infidel Christians in Rome. Very funny, ribald, mujun beyond measure, but such fancy scenery wasted on a story that belonged in the marketplace among the people. And we can imagine Jacob Montino showing Alwazan's manuscripts to his fellow Orientalists, as we know in fact he did, and observing wryly, he'd never been able to put this material on Arabic poetry to use, but saying that he was glad that the man once known as Giovanni Leone had crossed his path. And so I hope you too have enjoyed this brief encounter. I'm sure we have time for some questions. Michael. Uh, um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, since much of this material seems so distant from um, our general knowledge of uh, European literary uh, 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 sources and so forth, was there a subsequent history um, of these particular um, uh, works um, and circulation? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Arabic side? Yeah, on both sides, actually. Well, of course, the European theater, well, just, you know, grows enormously. In Italy, you have the Commedia della Arte developing in the last part of the century. What I described for you is just the little beginnings based on medieval farce with an enormous expansion in, in, in theater. And, and you know what happens in, in, in France and Italy. I want to particularly stress not only the development here, but the participation, I'm, okay, let me my glass. the participation, this kind of cross-fertilization in Italy between the learned and the popular theater, which also goes in the development of tragedy, and uh, the contrast I was trying, making very quickly, and the very important, and maybe not wholly benign, role of political, par of political patronage all the way through. In, in, uh, in North African countries, and then it crosses the board into, into the Ottoman world. Uh, and uh, you, you have a continuing vit vitality of the comic theater. There doesn't seem to have been, and this is in the larger project I'm doing, there doesn't seem to have been a development of tragic theater. And there doesn't seem uh, until, the, until the modern period. That is a, a difference. Uh, but, uh, and there doesn't seem to have been uh, a, 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 a very elaborate participation of people like this unusual Ibn Danyal of, of 12th century Cairo. Uh, the, 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 the high literary doesn't seem to come till the modern period. Uh, I, you know, rather than seeing this as a, a, only a downer, I think it's interesting to think about it. It needs to be studied more, in, and it is now getting studied in, in, in Arab studies. Uh, not having the political patronage can have its benefits. Uh, I'm thinking of the, the Guignol Theater in Lyon which of the late 18th and 19th century, which free of political patronage, d develops a very, very interesting uh, critical theater. So as I see, the field is yet to be, to be done. My main question that I'm trying to figure out is w where the, what we call the tragic is, is expressed in the literature of the period, I'm, though I'm gonna concentrate on my writing just, which I hope to time to the performance of the play, <laughs> if I could make it, uh, yeah. to the earlier period, it would be uh, interesting to know what does happen in regard to uh, how, the, the, how the tragic mode is, is expre experienced and written about in Arabic literature. Maybe somebody here knows. I'm told that we have to cut this off. I was going to ask, could they make a movie out of this? Well, it's going to be, uh, uh, the play is not on this topic. Play is, is very different. <laughs> uh, I, 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 uh, I'm helping on it, but it's, it's, it will not be this. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's an idea. <laughs> I wonder. Thank you very much. But maybe great, we can. Great, great <laughs>